It's our great pleasure today to have um, Eric Drew here. Eric is a PhD candidate from University of Toronto, advised by uh, Rene Miller. His research focuses on uh, data discovery and similarity search. Uh, he's a recipient of the Bell Graduate Scholarship and also a VLDB Best Demo Award. Without further ado, Eric. Thank you, yeah, yeah. Um, okay, so it's nice to be here. And my talk is on the search for joinable tables in data lakes. Um, so before I begin, I want to talk a little bit about my background. Uh, so I was born and raised in, in China, Hangzhou, and it was a technology hub and a home to Alibaba and some other tech companies. Unfortunately, I don't know anything about programming until I started my undergrad at University of Toronto. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I like it so much that I decided to do a PhD in programming, and I had no regret. So some of you might think I look familiar <laughs> because I did. <laughs> I was expecting more people. Uh, because I did an internship in 2016 at the DMS group. And I, well, I had a great pleasure to work with Ye Ye and Sergit. Um, so during the internship, we even won the first place in DMS Cup. Yeah, so that was a team effort. And let's go back to the main topic. Um, so I would like to start with the traditional enterprise data analytic workflow. So in this workflow, the data scientist has to work with a very heavy IT process to get data. Now, this uh, process is so inflexible that it prevents the data scientist from uh, iterating with new changes or trying out new ideas. So to make the life better for them, a new concept came along called data lake. So this data lake concept uh, advocates for uh, the data scientist to work directly with the raw data and bypass the IT. Now, uh, this way, the data scientists would enjoy much greater flexibility and be very happy. But is this a reality or a fantasy? We can take a look at uh, two examples. So in the first example, the data scientist has a table on companies, and he wants to find out more information about those companies. We can translate this question into a query for tables that could be joined with the existing table. Right? But the uh, existing solution for data lake, such as the data.gov, doesn't really support keyword search, or uh, it only supports keyword search and category browsing. So it cannot really handle uh, the query. In a different example, uh, let's say the data scientist already found a table that could be joined together. But the problem is, this table has different formats on the join columns. So he could spend, say, 15 minutes writing a script to make the format consistent before you apply the join. But imagine that you have, uh, you are trying with many new data sets, and you want to uh, iterate it with new changes. This uh, ad hoc script writing could potentially eat up a tremendous amount of work time. right? So uh, what happened is, instead of uh, bypassing the IT department, the data scientist effectively became the IT department. Right? So this is not necessarily a bad thing, because having flexibility is great. Uh, but on the other hand, now the job has become much more demanding and uh, carries more responsibilities. So my, the goal of my research is to make this job much easier. So to summarize my contributions, I developed algorithm for searching joinable tables in data lake, and as well as automatically join them. These algorithms will make data science more powerful. So in this talk, I want to focus on joinable table search. So how do we define this problem? Uh, we let the user would input a table we call it a query table. And we'll specify a column we call it a query column. And from a data lake of tables, we try to find tables that can be joined with my query table on the query column. So how do we define the relevance of those tables? Or how do we define joinability? So we define joinability as the fraction of distinct values 
in the query column that could be covered by the join. Okay, so why do we care about searching for joinable tables? I'm going to give you two motivating, motivating examples to show why. So in the first example, from uh, this is from Canadian Open Data. Uh, the query table is on the homicide count uh, 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 by firearms in Canada. So you can see this is definitely not the U.S. data. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so if we want to understand what is correlated with this trend, we could search for tables that can be joined on the time column. Now, looking from the data lake, we found a new table on the number of police officers in Canada. So when we put these two trends together, we discover some very interesting correlations. And from this one, we can perhaps even draw some unexpected conclusions. In a different example, uh, the query table is on the uh, pollution of various industrial facilities in Canada. And we want to predict the pollution amount. Now, if we search for joinable tables on the postal code column, we find a new table on the political campaign contributions. So the contributor's postal code can be joined with the postal code of the industrial facilities. So by joining these two tables together, we introduce potentially useful features for, for the prediction task. Okay, so um, if joinable table is so, a joinable table search is so useful, um, how can we integrate it into uh, an application? Right? I'm going to show you a demonstration uh, of this, uh, a system that we built for joinable table search. And you can see how user can interactively combine tables from a data lake to, uh, to create a, a table for their analysis. Right, so um, in this demo, the user will start with uh, a query table. So we find the query table using keyword search. So we look for uh, insert award data. So insert is similar to the NSF in, in the US. And um, by searching for insert award, we find the application, the partners in those uh, insert grant application. So these are the partners uh, or companies that applies for ASIC awards. And by searching on the ID columns, we find uh, the, a table about the awards themselves. Now we can join these two tables together. Now we associate the company that applies for the awards and the awards themselves. So from the award table, we find an interesting attribute the amount of money involved in this uh, research award or, or grant. And what we're doing now is we're writing a SQL query to uh, project out columns that we are interested in. And we select the column uh, about the company name, and we also take the sum of uh, the research grant that they received from NSERC. Now we have a new table after doing the projection. It summarizes how much money each company received from NSERC. We can continue on with searching for joinable tables, and we find more tables that could be joined with the company name column. So in this one, we find a table on the political campaign contributions. Now we join these two tables together. We link uh, every single contribution with the contributor, which are the companies in my previous table. So in this contribution table, we have the amount of money involved in each uh, contribution, as well as um, the political party of the candidate who's receiving the contribution. So we're going to run another SQL query to get uh, the attributes that we're interested in. So we select uh, the company name, the amount of money re they received from any award, 
and uh, the political party that those companies contribute to. And we are summing up the amount of donation, the total amount of monetary uh, donation or contribution they make to each political party. As you can see, the user are kind of combining various tables together using joinable table search to create uh, a new table that allows them to run uh, their analysis. So in the end, we get a table that correlates the amount of money they receive from NCERC and how much money they donate to political parties. And from this table, we can make some interesting discoveries. So that was the end of the demo. Um, hope you enjoyed it. <laughs> and um, so I want to give you an overview of the system behind the demonstration, right? Uh, so we first process the uh, sets from uh, columns in the data lakes. So from those sets, we index them in a search index. And then the user will input a table. We use the same process to extract the query set and then we query the search index. Then the search index would give us a list of columns and table IDs that could be joined with the query table, and that from which we render the user interface. So that's generally how the demo works. So this demo won the best demo award at VRDB 2017. The people are very excited about it. And the secret sauce that makes the search so interactive is the search index. So I developed two search indexes, the first one is LSH Ensemble, which published at VRDB 2016. And another one is called Josie, uh, is published at VRDB, uh, sorry, Sigma 2019, and has a US patent pending. So, yeah, go ahead. Just a couple of questions. So how big are these tables that you're indexing? Uh, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of tables. So typically, uh, an open data portal would have quite a number of tables. Uh, in terms of uh, CFD files or... And yeah. like how big were the largest tables that you had? The largest table that we have, actually we're going to talk about later, is uh, about 200, uh, 22 million rows. Yeah. And then in terms of the joinability, is your definition equally joined? Yes. Okay. So the demo that you saw was using LSH Ensemble. And I want to start with this one first. So when we talk about indexing the data lake, what are the challenges? So a data lake can have lots of large, uh, very big tables, as we, we, we talked about before. And so that leads to the sets being very large. So the largest set is 22 million different values. Another, on another dimension, data lake can have hundreds of thousands of tables. So we're talking about a lot of sets, right? So how do we deal with this type of scale? We use an approach called data sketch. So the data sketch, you can think of it as simply fixed size summaries of sets. And they have very interesting properties that give you probabilities to guarantee in estimating certain, uh, certain stuff like similarities. And they are very cheap to build. You just need to scan the table once. So out of many different data sketches, we picked uh, main hash for our uh, joinable table search problem. So I want to give you a quick review of how main hash works. So main hash is essentially a list of hash values generated by a list of random hash functions. Um, for each hash function, we scan across all the values in the set, and we keep the minimum hash value. And we do it for the second hash function, and so on until we have completed all the hash functions. So wh what are we going to do with these main hash signatures or, or sketches? It turns out that the minimum hash value has a very interesting mathematical property. So uh, the probability of two minimum hash value being equal is actually the same as the j similarity of the sets. So how can we use this? property for a joinable table search. We can use hash table to find approximately joinable columns under j similarity. What, am I, what, what do I mean by that? Because when columns 
if they are joinable, they would have some non-zero probability of hashing to the same key, right? If they're not joinable, they will have zero probability of hashing to the same key. So we can simply return the columns that get hashed to the same value as the query column. So that's very simple. We can even further improve the accuracy by using locality sensitive hashing index. So uh, the locality sensitive hashing, instead of using a single hash value as the key, we combine the hash value into a composite key and uh, keep them in a hash table. So this plot shows why LSH would improve the accuracy. As you can see, the x-axis is uh, the J-curve similarity of a candidate set. And the y-axis is the probability of retrieving these candidates from the LSH index. So there is an S-curve relationship between the probability and the J-curve similarity. Without using LSH, this relationship will be linear. So you can see the difference. So what LSH does is it allows us to optimize this S-curve around a given J-curve similarity threshold so that we can minimize the error probabilities. Essentially, we want to stretch the curve in a way that the area corresponds to the errors is the smallest, right? So now we know how LSH works. So before we move on to say, how about we just use LSH to search for joinable tables? We need to think about this problem, a uh, question, whether j curve similarity is the right measure for joinable tables. We can think about this using a small example. Let's say we have two pairs of sets, and their intersecting sides are the same, right? But the j curve similarities are very different. The first one would be much bigger than the second one. The reason for that is because the j curve similarity is intersecting size divided by the union size, and the second pair has a much bigger union size. So it's not fair, because these two sets are supposed to have the same relevance given our definition of joinability. So alternatively, we use a different similarity measure. Called, uh, so instead of dividing by the union size, we divide by the size of the query. Okay? So this is consistent with our definition of joinability. Now, we call this measure uh, containment, and we use that for our relevance score. So what we're really trying to do here now is how do we fix min hash RSH so that it can work with containment search. The result of this is uh, LSH ensemble, which is uh, uh, included in a, in a uh, Python public library uh, uh, called Data Sketch. So that this library has been used by a lot of people. It's widely popular. Uh, so from GitHub, you can see who uses your library as a dependency. So I found that Google, uh, MIT, and Stanford, they all use this one. So it has kind of big impact and generated over 760 stars on GitHub. So it was very popular. So before I talk about how uh, our search ensemble works, I want to give you some kind of intuition. Okay? So this formula, applying uh, inclusion exclusion principle, you can map a containment to a J card. All right? So what this gives us is a translation formula. So you can translate a containment threshold into a J card similarity threshold. How do we use this? Well, the user will say, OK, I want containment threshold to be T star. Use the translation formula, you get a J card threshold S star. And as you remember from before, we can use that S star to tune the LSH index to minimize the error with respect to that. Right? Yeah, it's all good. Can we just be done with it? There is a, a, a very big problem with this translation formula. Can you spot what is the problem? So the problem with it is that the x mod is not a constant. So x is the size of the set. And there are, of course, more than one size right, in the index. So instead of using this one, we can use an alternative approximation. 
So instead of using the size of every single set, we use the maximum size of all the sets. So that will give us a constant, right? Now, this is the consequence of using this approximation translation formula. The x-axis here is the containment threshold. And the y-axis here is a translated j car similarity threshold. And the top curve, the orange curve, is the correct translation function. Well, the bottom curve is the approximate translation function. So you can see the gap in between, or the area, is, will be the false positives. To give you a quick example, let's say my containment threshold is 0 0.6, and the correct translation should tell me the J-Cal similarity threshold to be 0 0.4. But in the end, what's actually being used is 0 0.2. So imagine you optimize the LSH index on 0 0.2, you will get in between 0 0.2 and 0 0.4 the false positive candidates, right? So you can say, okay, you know, false positive, we can always post process, right? We can verify their exact containment by computing them exactly. Um, yeah, it's easy, but the sets can be very large. So the post processing could be very expensive, right? <laughs> Now, I can show you uh, using the, a small example here. Uh, let's say I have an index and it has some different set sizes in this index. And there are some small sets and there are some large sets. And the maximum set size is 100. So for a set with size 3, the false positive area is really large, right? That's not good. It means that we're going to get a lot of sets in our post-processing step. So how can we fix that? A simple trick is just to you know, have separate indexes, one for the small sets, one for the large sets. So for the small sets, the upper bound is much, much smaller, and now it's 4. So the area for the false positive is much smaller. Right? And same for the large set as well. So Using this kind of uh, separate indexes, with the approach of using separate indexes, it essentially inspires us to develop a new solution for reducing the false positive instead of using brute force. So right. the second yeah. graph on the right hand side, your Jacquard threshold is really small, like 0.1. Yes, because the, uh, it's actually by the nature of a translation formula, because uh, but if you go back to the translation formula, it uses u divided by the query size. And if the query size is, is much smaller than the, the, the upper bound, then the line will close to a, a linear curve. But it's actually still a little bit curved because of the denominator is now much bigger. So in practice, you want like a containment threshold, let's say 0.7 or 0.8, right? What happens at that containment threshold? Uh, like, if you go to go back to the large set case that you had. Yeah. <coughs> like, don't you want? Oh, I see. So, right. you're saying at point 0.8, mm -hmm. you need to do Jacquard of point 0.1, but not too many false positives. 0 0.1. Right. But yeah. without too many false positives. Right, yes. So, 0 0.1, because the sets are now much bigger compared to query. Yeah. Uh, as, as we remember from before, I just want to insert a little bit of notes. The, the, the j car similarity is heavily influenced by the union size, right? So if the union size is bigger because of the sets is large, then you need to have smaller j car threshold for a large containment, yeah. Right. So our approach is, uh, so our approach, instead of using a single LSH index, we want to build uh, separate LSH indexes on partitions of the sets. So how do we create these partitions? We sort all sets by their sizes, and we create uh, disjoint partitions with increasing set sizes. So what happens is the first partition will have smaller set sizes than the second partition, and the second partition will have small set sizes, and the third partition, and so on. Right? So uh, the benefit of doing the partitioning is that it reduces the false positive rate at almost an uh, inverted quadratic of the differences in maximum set sizes. 
So now you may ask the question, if the partition is so powerful, can we simply create infinite number of partitions? Uh, the answer is, of course, it's not very viable because the query cost will be growing linearly with the number of partitions. So in order to uh, optimize the partitions, we derived a formula to compute the upper bound of number of false positive coming from each partition, given the size interval. So using this formula, we can try to solve a small example. Let's say I have uh, 100 sets and with uniform distribution of set sizes from 1 to 100. Now, I, I want to create two partitions. So we want to find, by looking for the bound, location of the boundary, we want to find the best boundary that gives us the smallest number of false positives. And the result is shown in this plot. So the x-axis is the partition boundary, uh, the middle line here. And the, uh, the y-axis is the number of false positive upper bounds. So by sliding it over these possible values, we find that the optimal two partition boundary is around 50. So now we know how to solve uh, the two optimal two partition case for a uniform distribution, right? But the problem is the real data distribution is not always uniform, right? In the case of open data, it's actually close to Ziffian. So how, how are we gonna do about that? So we can kind of model this problem as an integer programming problem. The variables are the partition boundaries. So given n partitions, you have n minus one different variables. And the objective is to minimize the total uh, false positive from all the partitions. So integer program is NP hard, but for this particular problem, we can actually solve it using dynamic programming. And the complexity of dynamic programming is big O of uh, n squared with n, big N is the size, so the total number of different sizes set sizes, and multiply by number of partitions. So the complexity seems really bad. It's big over n squares. But in reality, in practice, this is actually really manageable. It's very interesting. You can think of it as comparing the differences between how much money Jeff Bezos has and how much money I have. That's going to be in the hundreds of billions of dollars, right? At least before the divorce. So. Now, you compare that number with the number of bank accounts in the US, the, it's still gonna be smaller than the differences. So similarly, in uh, data lakes, we, for open data, we found there's about uh, 14,000 different uh, set sizes. And for web table, we found about 4,000 different set sizes. So it's actually not that big. And using Python in a laptop, we can actually finish the optimization in 10 minutes. So, that's right. <laughs> That's the uh, dynamic programming. So I want to summarize how uh, our ensemble works. The user would provide a query and say, "I want a containment threshold T stop." Now the indexing process uses information to uh, build the index. The first doing dynamic programming to optimize the partition boundaries build RSH indexes on each partition, and tune the RSH indexes using the con uh, translation formula. And during the query time, it simply probe the hash tables. And optionally, you can remove the false positive. But that will cost a lot less than if you don't use our optimization strategy. So the paper also talks about how to handle arbitrary query size and uh, containment uh, threshold so that user doesn't have to re-index everything before you can run a new query. So what's the benefit of using our search ensemble? Um, first of all, we didn't mention that you can actually parallelize your query over multiple partitions, right? Up to the point where, up to the number of cores you have on your machine, of course. Another benefit is the query footprint is much, very small because we're using main hash data sketch and it's very scalable. So we tested on the whole web table of 200 million sets. So that was our search ensemble. Uh, 
next, I'm going to move on to Josie, which is uh, a paper uh, that's published in this year in Sigma. So some people may ask me, okay, so for the same problem, why do you have two different algorithms? To be clear, there are different algorithms and different problems. So for LSH ensemble, it is an approximate index for threshold-based search. But for Josie, it's an exact algorithm, but for top K. So now what, when do we want to use top K? Right? So for threshold search, uh, the user would have to provide a containment threshold. So they may not even know what is the appropriate threshold to use. Sometimes it returns too many results, sometimes it returns too little. Let alone, they may not even understand what it means, right? Now, the top K doesn't have this problem. You simply return a predefined K results. And it, that's why it is used by the search engines, because the user doesn't actually care about how you rank their results. There's no knowledge of the me relevance measure is required. But the most interesting bit is that we find for an exact an algorithm, it can outperform LSH ensemble, with an, which is an approximate algorithm, when the LSH ensemble is using a decreasing threshold hack to do top K. So the idea was you just reduce the threshold until you get K results. Typically, you get 2K results and do the post-processing. So when do we use top K? We want to use top K when the user is not so sophisticated and the K is small. Uh, so this is actually very common, right? Now, we can start to define what is uh, top K overlap search. So we have a different name for the joinability measures. Uh, we call it overlap. It's actually equivalent to the intersection size. And it is also equivalent to the containment because for any given query, the, Q, uh, the size of the query is fixed, right? So before I start talking about Josie, I want to give you a very quick review of inverted index. It may look very different from the textbook. So inverted index is used by many exact algorithms. Uh, also, Josie is using inverted index. You can visualize it as a very gigantic matrix. So in this matrix, the rows are sets, and the columns are data values. If you take a row, you would get the data values that's contained in the set. Right? If you take a column, you get the sets that contain the data value. And we call this column a posting list. That's using the inverted index term, terminology. So um, let's say using inverted index, we want to find the top one overlap. right? And the first baseline we talk about is very simple. It's called posting list union. What do you do? You just read all the posting lists and count the appearance of each set and take the one that has the most appearances. Right? It's very simple. Now, if we look at how much it costs, it reads seven values. Okay? Um, now, the second baseline is called prefix filtering. Some of, them might, some of you might know this. The idea is a little bit involved. So instead of reading all the posting lists, you read them one by one. You read the first posting list and read all the set that you discovered from the posting list. Up to the point when there's no more new sets can beat the, one, the best one you have. So in this case, we found that X4 completely overlaps with my query. So we say, okay, X4 is a winner, we stop. So it costs 18 values. So in this case, the posting list union wins out uh, prefix filtering. But if we change sets, we get a different results. In this case, the prefix filtering read a lot less value than the posting list union. So why is there such differences? This is because both none of these uh, algorithms consider read cost. Uh, why do we care about read cost then? Because cost is huge in data lake. As we remember from before, data lake has very large sets, a lot of them. Also very long posting lists, and a lot of them as well. So the cost of reading 
those processes and sets can be not, cannot be neglected. Therefore, a very efficient algorithm that works for data lake must be able to reduce read costs. So how do we reduce read costs? It's actually very interesting. If you read uh, a candidate set, you can actually reduce the work that you would have to do to read the post list. So here's how it goes. Let's say we read a post list and we start reading X4. And we found that X4 has overlap of four with my query, right? Now, what does it mean is for any new sets that we haven't seen from the post list that we haven't read, the maximum overlap can, have, can be at most three because they can only show up at, at most three places, at V4, V5, and V7. So we can say they're never going to make it to the top one, and we can stop. We limit all the post lists. That's how if we read a candidate set, we reduce the work of reading post lists. It works the other way around as well. If we, let's say we read two post lists, and we discover these candidate sets up there. X1, X2, X3, X4. So if we assume that the current top one overlap is four, let's just say it's four, okay. What we know from the posting list is that X1, X2, and X3 can have, has, has only one uh, value after V4, the last posting list that we read. So what does this mean? It means that these candidates that can have at most two overlap with my query because they also has only one overlap in the post list that we've seen. So we we'll say, well, they can have at most two overlaps. We don't care about them. So we, by reading the po two post lists without reading the candidate set, we get rid of them, um, get rid of the read, read costs associated with those candidate sets. So Essentially, what you can see is that we can go both directions. You can read posting lists to get rid of some candidate sets, or you can read candidate set to get rid of some posting lists. So this kind of uh, choices inspire us to create Josie. So for Josie, we define work as the amount of cost a uh, read cost associated with re read the remaining points list and candidate sets. And we define progress as the reduction in the work. As you have seen before, reading candidate sets reduce work, reading post lists also reduce work. But there's a cost associated with each progress. By reading the candidate set, you would have to pay the price of reading it. And same for the post list. So the algorithm works as follows. As long as there's work remain, you estimate the progress that's involved in each direction and pick one that gives you the best net progress, which is defined as the progress minus the price. So this seems simple, but the magic actually goes on into this algorithm is in this line. We use a cost model to estimate the progress. Um, for the presentation, I don't have lots of time to cover this detail. We can carry it offline or after the presentation. But the answer is in the title. So we use intersection estimation to build up this cost model. We evaluate Josie on uh, two benchmarks, the open data and web tables. And we observe a very good performance, up to five times over the baseline of the exact algorithms. I think the other interesting bit is that it can get up to two time performance over our such ensemble when using uh, the decreasing threshold hack. But the catch is it only uh, worked well for a small query. Uh, query. Actually, it's not that small. The query under 5,000 different values and small k, so k under 20. But I think it's reasonable because most of the time, user won't look beyond um, 10. So this plot shows the performance comparison between Josie and the baseline exact algorithms. You don't have to look further than this line. This is the k equal to 10. And this is Josie, and these are the exact uh, baselines. So 
it just completely annihilates the other approach and shows how important it is to consider weak costs in data lakes. Okay, so that concludes Josie. Um, in addition to joinable table search, I want to talk about um, other works that I have done in uh, the area of data lake. So the one that worth mentioning is AutoJoin. It is a project that I did during my internship at MSR. Actually, I think many of you were actually at the presentation uh, at the end of my internship. So this paper led to a VRDB 2017 paper, thanks to Yeye, who was really good. <laughs> and this algorithm, what it does is essentially automatically generates a transformation function um, that can convert the formats into a consistent format uh, for equal join. So what is the highlight of this algorithm? So the highlight is that unlike many existing approaches, this algorithm does not require any user inputs, does not require users to provide examples. Um, I also did other work in searching uh, uh, tables in Data Lake. So uh, in this work, table union search, instead of searching for joinable tables, we search for tables that can be stacked together and align the columns. You can create a master list of certain type of records. So, Beyond search, we also look at how do we organize uh, tables into a category, hierarchical category, according to the topic. Uh, the idea is to help users to minimize the number of hoops they would need to do in order to arrive at the table that are interested in. So in terms of future work, uh, there are many different directions that we can go. The first one I want to talk about is uh, the pre-processing step. So, so far, we only considered equal join on key, uh, uh, sorry, equal join on data values. We haven't really considered the case of, let's say, multi-sets. Right? What if your joinability definition is not the dis on distinct values, but on the number of rows? You want to maximize the number of rows you want to join. So you may want to use multi-sets. Uh, another case is, let's say you have different representation of the same entities, and you want to join your entities. So you could do entity resolution to pre-process the sets so that you can join tables on the entities. We haven't really think about how to deal with numerical data, because the join semantic right now, such as equal join, doesn't really work for numerical data, with decimal points especially. And we all haven't considered uh, using embeddings to represent the sets of data values so that we can join tables in semantic space. A different uh, avenue is to further enhance the joinable, uh, the search indexes. So we can build uh, extension to DBMS. We can consider the case of distributed indexes. And we can also further improve the performance. We can actually talk a little bit about that offline if you're interested. Last but not the least, we can have many different interesting applications of joinable table search. The obvious one lies in, say, ML and BI systems, where you can automatically introduce new features or new attributes for your an analysis. And two other uh, applications that I have, I, can, I, I, I have thought about is, uh, for the first one is open data so citizen data science. So the idea is we have so many open data that's been published on the web. As we have seen, there's hundreds of thousands of tables that were just for tabular data. How do we make a tool that allow journalists or inspired citizens, voters, to understand public policy or their implications with evidence, right? Um, we don't really have a very good tools for them. We have some uh, data portals, such as data.gov, but it's extremely hard to find data in them or relevant data sets. So we could apply joinable table search to further enhance those data catalogs, for example. Um, another application that we haven't considered is um, data marketplace. So you have lots of people selling the data, you know, lots of people will try to buy data, 
but how am I going to know that your table or your data is valuable to me? Right? So we may need a third party to verify that. Uh, so using general table search, you could kind of bridge this, to, this gap. You can find tables that can actually join with your table, give you some level of confidence that the data will be valuable before you pay the money. So that concludes my talk. It's a bit early. Um, I welcome any questions. I have a question. Yes. So uh, you use containment index, uh, containment yeah. values between the two joint columns. So in that case, I assume, I think you assume the semantic consistency between these two columns. Yes. So yeah, if that's the case, then you can of course do that. So I'm just wondering if, if that's not the case, what happens? So for example, there are two columns in two tables. They have similar string values, but they are referred to different stuff. Right. So in that case, I am curious about if containment in index is useful anymore, or what's happening after. I think in that case, what's more interesting is um, what's after the job. Right. Yeah, that's a very good question. So I have three different ideas. The first one is, uh, as you mentioned, how do we handle the case when uh, there are two different cases? One is you do the join, but you, you, you join things that doesn't make sense. For example, you join age with ID. It doesn't make any sense. So we need to be able to filter out those candidates. So we could apply some semantic annotation on the columns so if the, the meaning of the columns are so different, then maybe we should filter them out. That's one thing. Uh, the other thing is, what if there are two, uh, two tables that are supposed to be joined, but because they don't uh, agree syntactically, right, then we can perhaps use the entity resolution or engrams to, to uh, help them you know, increase this type of recall problem. Uh, the other question that you have, how, how would, what happened after the join? Or what happened after you find those joinable candidates? Uh, yes, the work that I did does not really consider uh, the semantic meaning of doing those joins. So we rank the results based on the joinability and let the user to decide on, say, whether this candidate is meaningful. So if, I think there's a lot of work that can be done for that as well. Yeah, I yeah. think there probably can be some metrics, right. I mean, after the join, that helps you determine if there's a good join. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks. So, there's been a lot of work done on foreign key detection, right? Like doing mm -hmm. a yeah. once to M join. Right. Then many other signals beyond just the containment may be necessary. That you may need to understand table names, column names, and yeah. other signals. Yeah, foreign does that, right? Right. So there are many prior work that has done that. Yeah. I mean, the way I see it is that you are having an efficient way to compute <laughs> containment or other similarity measure yeah. that could be used in such algorithms. Yeah, yeah. So it's like uh, orthogonal. So you can actually use those uh, a technique to in, to improve the recalls or precision of the results. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. So does your first work, does it handle multi-column keys? So if I have Johnny, yeah, that's that's one of the uh, future work that I haven't put it on. Yes, uh, we are we are looking at the problem of let's say you have very strong signals if you have multi columns uh, match, right? And uh, you can improve the join accuracy as well. So yeah, that's definitely a very interesting avenue. But I think this type of algorithm would would be using the single column search as uh, building blocks. So we're kind of pre post processing all the results of single column search. Candidates, yeah. I mean, your pre-processing cost may shoot up a lot if you need to handle multiple. Yeah, yeah, because the mismatch, right? Because we consider a column as a set, but now we break up the row correspondence, right? So then there's the search space is actually bigger that way. Yeah. So the the, the other sort of quote, quote obvious question is, what do you do if 
there, is, there are two columns that are very similar in the values, but you don't necessarily have exact matches. So, so in, in a way, your auto-join paper already goes in this direction, but it doesn't have to be the definition of auto-join. Mm. So if I were to wanted to extend your work to find two columns which have very similar but often not identical values, mm -hmm. and um, again, feel free to use any similarity definition on the values themselves, right. Um, can you talk a little bit about how I would do that? Uh, there, we, we could, first of all, use uh, engrams to break the values into, we don't necessarily need to fix size engram, we could use engrams that appears very rarely, that could provide very strong signals for a possible join. And we could also use, um, there's some previous work in detecting the regular expression of uh, given a column. So we could use regular expression to tokenize the values into possible compositions of different uh, parts and then apply uh, the set similarity search technique on top of that as well. Okay. Yeah, so, yeah. So you talked earlier about having a very large corpus of tables and I assume mm -hmm. with that number of tables you must be crawling the web or something or just pulling. Obviously, a lot of these tables are junky, you know, they're dirty, um, they're in mutually inconsistent. And so I go off, you know, and I go off and I use your system to find potential joins, but then what? I mean, it's, it's, there may be, how do I, how do I distinguish um, which joins are actually going to be producing useful answers or not? Do I have to go through a whole cleaning phase before I ever apply any of your techniques? to a database of a couple hundred thousand tables, that doesn't seem like it's going to work either. Yeah, so, yeah, I think the, uh, for a real world application of a joinable table search system, we would really need to build up the uh, refinement phase. So given all the candidates that could be joined, we need to use a lot more signal just beyond simply containment to, to understand which table should rank higher than the other one. So I think it's similar to like a search engine. You, you have inverted indexes uh, to retrieve the candidates, a couple thousand of them, and use page rank algorithms or some similarity measure to find um, the results that should be more relevant according to the query. Yeah, um, yeah, that's definitely it too. So it's not that easy because the search engine handles stuff that people always search. Barack Obama or presidents of the United States, everybody search for that. But when it comes to this domain specific search problem, uh, the long tails have, users may have different requirements and they may not always be the same. So yeah, it's a very in uh, challenging problem, of course, because different analysts may want different type of tables. Uh, how do you come up with a consistent relevance measure that works for both? That could be very challenging. Yeah. See, either because either you're working with a small corpus, in mm -hmm. which case you have schema, yeah. and you can do all kinds of. I mean, even even the n squared um, prop you know, analysis of pairwise table, it's tractable. You know, mm -hmm. as long as the number of tables doesn't grow too large. Right. And when it grows very large, then you must be working on a very dirty um, mm -hmm. corpus. In which case, it seems like the problem you just um, described of, of being able to understand the quality of the answer and sorting through which ones are useful or not is an absolutely essential ingredient to make this whole thing of any practical value. Yeah, yeah, so Important. we could work on it <laughs> okay. at Microsoft. I don't know if you guys are interested in it. Yeah. Yes, go ahead. Uh, so, as for example, as a user of, of the system, how do I interpret the containment? Uh, threshold. Like, right, if I yeah. say, how do I set it? Uh, if I don't know anything about database, what value should I put there? Uh, like, yeah, you can use top K. Okay. So okay. Case, uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> or, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, the other case is, if you, I mean, it depends on your requirement, right? If you simply kind of casually browse, then I would say top K is good. But if you have specific requirement, let's say you really want to cover all the tuples in your, in your table, you don't want any no values, you don't want to do left outer join. You know, in that case, 
uh, then perhaps using a strict containment threshold will be good. Yeah. Mm, I don't know how to set the value of like threshold rate. Oh, yeah. Do you, do you oh, to understand it? Um, how does that measure, like, for example, resemblance? I mean, somehow, how does it translate? I think it's kind of relevant to yeah. the relevance of the results, right? Right. So uh, think about a uh, foreign key, key join case. That's uh, probably the most common. Um, use case. So you have a query table which has a foreign key, and you want to find a table that actually uses as a key, right? Uh, in that case, you can say, well, for all the different foreign keys I have in my table, how much of it has been covered by the key keywords? So that's, you say, whether it's a strong indication, yeah, yeah, it, it's a foreign key key relationship, or it's very weak. It's not a complete coverage. So if you got a complete coverage, then you can actually join table together perfectly. That's more of a relevance measure for you, for this case. Uh, depends on the use cases, of course. The, de the one that you saw in the demo, neither the query column or the column that you use for join are, are keys, right? Like when I join for company names with um, the contribution table, the contribution table, the key is the ID of the contribution. So we actually had to do an aggregate over the, um, over the company names. So um, the, reason, I mean, the reason why we use sets, semantics, because it's able to handle that case. Right? If we only consider the number of roles, which is probably more understandable for the user perspective, it may not work as well. Because imagine you have end-to-end -end join of the same value, then uh, it's just going to artificially inflate the relevance score, right? I hope, I, I don't know, hope I answered your question? Yeah, yeah I mean, thank okay. you for the answer. Yeah. Thanks. So the LSH Ensemble Index, you yeah. said there are people who are using it. Do you have some idea of who is using it for what purpose? So the LSH Ensemble Index, I, I need to make uh, more clear. clear. The, I don't think people, a lot of them, are using LSH Ensemble Index. We, I, I know they are using it because I also have a different library in Golang that has people using it. And there are people telling me, you should add a license to it, otherwise I can't even use. So I'm sure there are people using it, but not as popular as Minha LSH. Um, so the data sketch library is extremely popular because at one point, uh, somebody published an uh, open course, I think online course, that talks about data sketches and uses my library as a course material. Okay. Yeah. yeah, so that's what happens. It, it's very interesting because uh, lots of people try to say, uh, try, try to contribute to this library. So I, for example, they even had a Redis backend to store the LSH index. And because they, they have so many documents that need to index, and the memory is not even enough. So, yeah, so that was in, very interesting. Any questions? Oh. Okay, cool. Let's end this.